Marta, since this is actually not just because this is your house, <laughs> uh, but also because you, I think, framed it well when we were just chatting in the, in the green room there. It's like it's deliberately you know, regulating emerging technologies. It's a broad thing, right? Everyone's talking about AI. You just have to walk along the, uh, the promenade and it's the talk of the town. But really, you're trying to broaden the concept here to be ready for all emerging technologies because this is just going to get accelerated no matter what. So lay out what you mean by that and why it's important to frame regulation around this emerging concept. Yeah, so I think when it comes to regulating technologies, fundamentally there's this, I think, disconnect between the idea that you have this technology and you need to go regulate the technology. I think um, it's really great to have this conversation, not just about cryptocurrency, not just about um, AI, not just about all of the other emerging technologies, but to actually talk about what does it mean when we have emerging technologies, how should lawmakers respond to that? And for me, my view on that is rather than regulating technologies, what we should be doing is regulating activities, right? Like we don't regulate the internet. Um, but in fact, there are all sorts of specific activities, existing laws and rules that can apply to emerging technologies. And then sometimes you need very specific uh, clarifications, things like stablecoin legislation, right, in the, in the cryptocurrency context. So I, I'm really excited to be here today to, to be able to talk to all of you about this idea of what it means when we have new technologies, how the law should respond. Well, on that note, I'll go to you, Sean, because you were part of the roundtable discussion we had here on Tuesday where we looked at the intersection of blockchain and AI and how policymakers should deal with that. And one of the things that came up was yeah, in a, another version in a way of what uh, Marta was saying, right? Don't regulate uh, open source platforms, but maybe you know, think about the applications. Maybe drill down on that for a little bit and tell us why that's important. So innovation is very critical for you know, progress in human Mankind technologies continue to evolve. I mean, it used to have be a, it used to be a ten-year big uh, technology cycle, then five. Now it's almost two two years, right? Every two years, and it continues to shorten the, the innovation cycle. Continues to shorten. Regulation and technology are like two pins within a rubber band, right? And as technology continues to move forward, the regulation has to catch up. So the gap between them is ideal. What happens is regulation, um, you know, especially when they are draconian and large, overall um, puts the pin and is stuck and technology tries to move forward, it keeps, it keeps getting pulled back. So within that context, um, technology alone itself isn't bad. It's about how it's used, how it's applied. So having a regulation that's more precision based and focused on how it's applied, how it's used, what apps it's used for is much clearer for the, the people that are using this technology and compliance will be a lot more positive than just the complaining and uh, the cost of compliance that uh, these organizations has to go through. Right, so, so you know, Dante, you've been involved for some time now in um, specifically policy making and, and policy advocacy within the blockchain space. Um, what lessons uh, do you think you can draw from, from that battle? I think that's probably a reasonable <laughs> word to use. Uh, you know, for, for how you know, policymakers should face these emerging technologies. Yeah, I, I guess I would say a couple quick things. Number one, I'm incredibly grateful to the AI community <laughs> that they have come and made the promenade their coming out party. Because it means <laughs> that the blockchain and crypto assets community could stop talking about the tech, very much to Marta's <laughs> point. When the tech is a protagonist, it's very early. Um, and so if you're not attention seeking and you're result seeking, it's a very good Davos, right? Because you could actually describe the results, the outcomes and the things to be done. The other, um, the other quick point I would make is that when you talk about any novel or exponential technology, AI, crypto, blockchain, quantum computing, you name it, the spectrum that the regulator and the policymaker thinks of are two extremes, right? In the crypto world, it's the crypto anarchist versus the crypto utopian. And it turns out that if you want to build a business, as Circle has, the crypto pragmatist is probably the most likely place to be. In the AI world, somewhere between a glorified version of Clippy or the Terminator movie, <laughs> somewhere in the middle is where we will, in fact, land. Um, and then I would say, oftentimes, unfortunately, regulation and policy is always going to be a lagging outcome. Um, but as we've learned, for example, with the, the many, many horrible things that have happened in the crypto industry, for example, in the last two years, 
Telling a market to put on their seatbelt after the crash is not consumer protection. And so um, there's a lot of both vindication of the regulator and the policymaker, but there's also a lot of vindication of the well-regulated, the onshore uh, Japan is doing a victory lap around the world because FTX, the platform that FTX had in Japan that was regulated onshore, segregated the customer funds. It's good hygiene. That's not a technology activity. That's just good hygiene. And so tech is neutral. A hammer in the hands of someone who wants to build a house can help you finish the house, but can also be destructive in the wrong hands. Right. OK, and for the European perspective, Casper, um, certainly in the Web2 era, you know, it was, it, Europe was in an interesting and perhaps difficult position of having to regulate technology, which was largely controlled by US companies. Uh, dr drill down into what that means for, for Europe going forward. Yeah, so having worked both in governments and the European Union, but also in the private sector of one of the big technology companies, you know, I don't know whether I'm spoiling the parts, but I think a little bit as Dancer said, I think there is always going to be a gap between where technology is and where the regulators are going to be. And I think we've seen that also recently with the development of the AI Act inside the European Union. It was basically postponed to take into account the arrival of the large language models. And I think, um, you know, again, I don't want to be pessimistic here, but I don't think we're going to hit, uh, you know, the AI Act um, in the first attempt and get it completely right. So I think there is going to be a, a lag between it. I think the more interesting aspect, which of course is also what you're alluding to, Michael, is you know, what does all of this mean for Europe? Because in many ways, I think what the European Union and what European decision makers are incredibly concerned about is the dependency on non-European technology. And that is certainly the case in the AI area where I think Europeans are trying to mitigate the dependency on non-European technology. But I think the big question is whether we're going to find the regulatory agenda where in fact the administrative compliance requirements are going to make it a lot more difficult for European companies to be successful in, in a time and a place where emerging technologies are going to be uh, incredibly influential. So I'm sort of positive and proud that Europe is leading the way. I'm less positive about the consequences for Europe's economy and the ability to grow new companies that can be global competitors. I want to pick up on that because we talked a little bit in the green room as well about like whether or not an open source-based technology, it, that question is as relevant, right? Is geopolitical division going to be as big a concern if it's just produced by developers everywhere? But let's get back to that. What I want to pick up on, Martha, is Casper just said he's not that optimistic about getting it right in the first time, presumably in that, that, they, that they will just come back and iterate and they will get it right. But what are the risks here? Like if, 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 if regulation is done badly, if there is a mistake, a small one, a big one, whatever, um, because things are moving so fast, uh, within AI especially, but as you say, all these other technologies as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so I think one thing that we've seen in the United States um, in the cryptocurrency space, um, particularly this past year, is we've had um, very overzealous regulation, which has led to token projects having an almost impossible time um, in the United States operating. And so we've seen, from the United States perspective, a lot of companies um, moving uh, to other countries, um, you know, most token projects would be crazy to, to start a, a project in the United States at this point. So we've seen overzealous regulation lead to a place where innovation cannot thrive in the United States. And I think when it comes to AI, I worry a lot about the knee-jerk reaction to AI leading to overzealous regulation that will not allow the innovation to thrive. Just to give you an example, you know, when I hear about things like regulating, you know, the, the GPUs, regulating computing, you know, the amount of compute, to me, this is um, really reminiscent of the early uh, sort of what we called the early crypto wars, the encryption wars, when back when encryption um, was was you know somewhat new, it was regulated in the United States like a weapon with with export controls. And so when I hear people using the same types of language, and uh, when it comes to AI, I worry a lot about thinking about AI through that same lens. Um, also, when it comes to AI, there's this knee-jerk reaction around uh, AI being able to learn from information that's available on the open internet, right? Um, and a lot of people saying, well, if AI is looking at my content, I should be receiving some sort of um, compensation from that. And I understand that knee-jerk reaction, but I also think that there is an absolutely critical precedent um, that enables things like Google to exist, right? That machines should be able to go out and look at what's on the open internet. 
um, and learn from it, um, and that that's not you know copyright infringement. And so I think these knee-jerk reactions are are absolutely understandable to this new technology, but I worry a lot about what that is going to mean uh, for enabling the innovation to actually be able to thrive. Uh Sean, one of the ways in which innovation does get uh, squeezed, uh, to, to pick up on what Marta was saying, is that overzealous or maybe well-intended, whatever it is, you know, it places a compliance burden right, on, on startups, something that's much, easy, much more easily absorbed by a big company. Um, how, how, what's, what's the current state of play in that regard? I mean, are we, are we, are we seeing that already, and, and how do we mitigate for that? Well, I, I can tell you right now, um, if you look at regulations, just AI regulations, 30-plus countries around the world are already have some form of a policy regulation in place. Now, each one is different. If you're an organization that has international operations, then to be compliant with every jurisdiction that's put, put out their regulation, it's really exorbitant costs. Um, the ne next one is, if you're just a startup, you have come up with a phenomenal technology that can change human's life, but then your cost of compliance in every one of these jurisdictions is too high. The number that I heard just for legal advice on compliance was about 300K for a small startup. And that's, that's an exorbitant amount of money just to be compliant to some things. I, how do we address this? I think there is a need for uh, international collaboration across all the regula regulators. There's a need for simplification of the regulation to say these are uh, the base structures, and then on top of it, you know, if there is something, for example, in uh, in US, there is the Executive Decision for the AI Act, and then there's a New York uh, policy that the state put out. So these are all, you know, they're completely different, and the co the cost of compliance is different. It doesn't drive one from the other. So it's it's. Collaboration, need for alliance, need for education enablement, that is absolutely necessary. Now, the cynic in me is going to say that that, that is by design, not, not because it's for the better of the outcome, but, that, but, but policymakers are going to policy make, right? That there is this, and I was actually interested in talking to somebody this morning, we had, a, had that round table today as well, we're looking at tokenization and, 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 and policy making as a, as a hurdle and how to deal with that. And somebody who talked about how there's this instinct amongst regulators, I'm going to turn to you on this, Dante, because you've been in there in the, uh, in the halls of power, and, um, to just to want to name things, like identify a technology, identify an asset class, and, and ultimately just lays, layers and layers of, of unnecessary complications. Because if we're thinking about letting a technology thrive, categorizing everything, and then putting regulatory frameworks around that creates all that bureaucracy. But if I'm thinking about Charm's example as well of a, you know, a New York regulator versus a federal regulator, each wants their power base. And naming something is an act of empowerment, right? So how do we have a conversation with policymakers that somehow acknowledges that instinct? Because governments are going to want, they don't like things they can't control. But we have to let this, this they, there is a certain act of letting go that we want these policymakers to do. What's the, what's the payoff for them? How do you convince them that it's time to step back a little bit? Yeah, and, and, and I think just we should not, of course, forget the somewhat selfish instinct, which is that if something fails and it fails on your watch, as a public policymaker, you're likely to be accountable, right? So after the collapse of stable and name only coin Terra Luna, which bought the stadium naming rights in Washington, DC, uh, some public policy questions should be asked, not of the industry, but of the entity that was responsible for letting the fox watch the chicken coop. <laughs> um, I would also add one more thing. As much as oftentimes the instinct among regulators and policymakers is consumer protection, market protection, and so on, in, in being so overzealous as Marta described it, we could also protect whole economies from job creation, technological relevance, the industries of the future. And so it, it should be very notable, as much as I think there's been a, again, thank you AI, a shift in the technology conversation. Um, it should be notable that in the coldest, darkest, most biting uh, time of crypto winter, most of the G20 nations have started laying out whole of economy, whole of government frameworks for regulating digital assets. The untouchable corner of fringe finance that created Sam Bankman Fried and Terra Luna and terrible things in between uh, is getting whole of government regulatory clarity. Now to the industry players, those on the stage and those in the audience, 
um, sorry to say, the cost of arrival is that you're likely going to get regulated. So you've arrived. <laughs> Casper. <laughs> Let's Casper, bring, you've bring arrived. in the European perspective because I so think you that want me to be more positive. You, you're going to be. <laughs> I'm <laughs> asking you to, I'm <laughs> to get, get in your happy space. No, and, and, and it's actually I'm looking for, for the you know the, the positive take on Europe because uh, essentially, like one would think that how many members are in the EU? Is 37 now? It's 30, 27. 27. That's right. So we used to be 28. <laughs> that's right, you did. Uh, that there would be like it, it would seem an impossible, you know collection of entities to try to get together, like herding cats. How are you ever going to get regulation done? Ironically, in the blockchain space, that cat herding exercise has been far more effective and, and uh, uh, you know, at processing new regulations in that space, as well as the fact that through the sort of passporting systems and everything else, you end up with actually a much more homogenous form of regulation than the New York versus federal environment that Sean was alluding to. So, does that actually give Europe an, an, an advantage? Is there, I mean, how can Europe actually capitalize on, on, on the history of how it's doing that to sort of bring sure. a lesser compliance burden, is what we're talking about here, to, to startups? Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, I mean, being a former diplomat, being positive and optimistic is extremely difficult, but I'll give it a <laughs> shot here. <laughs> there long. And I, a couple of points here, because I think, you know, it, it's actually not only what is happening on the AI Act, the European Union. What we're seeing in Europe is actually what I would call a tsunami of regulations coming forward that has different impacts on new technologies. So you have the DSA, you have competition issues, you have the ESG agenda. And I think you know, your point is a point I often make myself. You know, it's actually the aggregation of these compliance requirements that are going to take fundamentally potentially the life of especially small and medium-sized enterprises and certainly for, for the startups. So I think that's one of the challenges in Europe. The other one is, you know, without comparison, um, and I lived in California for a while, so I think you have big states that have huge regulatory power and impact but you have the, the, the lack of a level playing field, which is very difficult for the companies. You have a little bit of the same in the European Union, because when you look at, let's again take the AI Act, you know, that is a centralized act which has been negotiated among the 27 member states, but it is a decentralized implementation, which means that it's going to be up to Danish authorities or you know, Belgian authorities or Italian authorities to interpret and then put, put uh, compliance requirements out there. And I think that is actually one of the challenges in Europe that we have an internal market that doesn't really function. And I personally think it's one of the biggest disadvantages in driving new technology companies forward that can compete also on the global stage. And that brings back the dilemma for Europe, which is you know, if we don't lean into the new technologies, if we don't do that from the public sector or for the private sector, we're going to miss out on global competition. But the more we lean in, the more dependent Europe is going to be mm. on non-European technology. And I think that really sums up what is uh, you know, the frightening uh, scenario for a lot of European decision makers these days, which I think could lead to an over-regulation uh, that actually reinforces the problem Europe is standing in front of. So as you can see, I ended up in a very pessimistic way. I gave it a shot, <laughs> I failed completely, but um, you know, I'm sorry about that. Okay, well, I mean, what is if we can rescue him back, you know, drag him back into the happy space? I, I think that, um, again, I, I, an open source environment is a different one than one that is, that is a centralized corporate-led software environment, right? So, so we have now the capacity to um, essentially leave that technology as an as a international or a transnational, under-regulated or just like you know, development space. And then the activities that the citizens of those each countries, that gets regulated as a separate way. It, it seems to me, and uh, certainly looking at the crypto space, and we've, we've been asking these questions for some time about stable coins and CBDCs, that um, there will be an emergence of some sort of geopolitical battle over the, over the appealingness or otherwise of, of actually the jurisdiction, of actually the regulation. You know, the idea that maybe a US dollar CBDC or stable coin that is really preserving of people's privacy could be you know, a wonderful way to outcompete you know, a surveillance coin in China or something, right? So, I mean, putting that, that as one example, but looking more broadly here, Marta, what, what is, how does this play out in a sort of geopolitical sense? So I think, that, I think that when it comes to thinking about regulating these technologies, there's a really important question about what do you actually need to affirmatively do and what existing laws can already apply and do already apply, right? Um, so for example, just use the cryptocurrency space, which um, you know, Dante and I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about 
As an example, in cryptocurrency, there are actually not that many new laws or regulations that you need to make in order to have cryptocurrency operate and uh, be able to innovate and thrive in a place. For the most part, applying existing laws and regulations will work. So for example, uh, if you commit fraud, right? It doesn't matter <laughs> what technology you use to commit fraud and whether it's email or pen and paper or US dollars or cryptocurrency, right? So we already can and do apply a lot of existing laws and regulations to cryptocurrency. However, there are a couple of things where it has become very clear that what we need from lawmakers around the world is uh, clarity that will enable these technologies to operate. And I think the two biggest places where you see that you really need clarity, that that is something that will help the industry uh, innovate and thrive and keep bad actors out are, um, I would say, first, stablecoin legislation. That's a place where we really need affirmative clarity. We need lawmakers to affirmatively do something. And then the second is, in the US, we affirmatively need clarity about when and under what circumstances cryptocurrencies are securities, when they're regulated under securities laws, when they're regulated under commodities laws. Um, but I think it's actually, there's actually less for regulators to do mm. than they think. I think there's, for the most part, you can apply existing laws and regulations, and there are places where you need very specific pieces of clarity. Um, and, and cryptocurrency is just one example, but I think the same applies for AI. You look like you want to say something. Yeah, I did. I, I was going to make a bit of a joke and then a serious comment, <laughs> mostly for my diplomat friend. <laughs> the joke Appreciate that. is remember when George Bush said the French had no word for entrepreneur. Um, and, and the, uh, but the serious part of that joke, vis-a-vis -vis transatlantic competition and transatlantic regulatory competition, is that when you go to a country where the policymaker and the regulator and industry clearly have an industrial policy that is about competition, there's something really, really dynamic at play. Go to Brazil and have a conversation with the Brazilian central bank about public-private innovation and payments and fast money. Um, and so I, I would argue that notwithstanding the void at the federal level in the United States, um, the operating model we live under in the US is a, if you're going to do nothing, at least do no harm, which is why companies grow, and they can grow at the state level. And the states are the laboratories of democracy as much as they are the laboratories of innovation. That's me playing American diplomat. Whereas- Doing really, really well, so- um, Who is it should run for office? You, well, you know, say, yeah. whereas yeah. contrasted to this side of the Atlantic, of course, the Swiss is a different place, a very innovative country, or, you know. But if you contrast it to Europe, for the last five years, whole of economy rules have been developed for fear of a single big tech project mm -hmm. uh, called the Markets and Crypto Assets Framework. And that entire time, the totality of the industry has largely been told, do not invest and do not build in Europe. And so Europe has maybe one major digital assets firm, which has deliberately set itself up to be a hardware and software provider, <clears throat> as opposed to an exchange or a stablecoin issuer, and there's no company of substance yet. And it's not surprising that an American company Circle is investing to build a digital euro in France. Um, and so I think there's a question to be had about the industrial policy in which mm. regulation can be pro-innovation and pro-competition, but in fact, technology neutral. And so that would be the advice to the regulator and the policymaker listening in, is this is a matter of economic competitiveness, strategic security, and to be a little bit more nimble, principled as opposed to prescriptive in your rulemaking. Like that framing, I want to come back to it because there's a, there's a historical question right there, but just quickly, Sham, um, this idea that really, that Marta raised, that really just don't, you don't need to do too much, right? Can we apply that to AI? I mean, is it the same? Is it sort of get out of the way is the best thing for regulators? Uh, I love the idea, but with the right guardrails, guardrails being, you know, um, regulators or even organizations that advise the policymakers to have open source tooling that shows the level of compliance. Right? And this is, this is very important because uh, things like bias, ethics, and discrimination, all of these can be captured in metrics. And those metrics can be used to say what level of compliance do you or your project has that allows you to run fall. And, and this is completely open source collaboration. Um, IBM, along with a number of institutions, of uh, driving the AI Alliance. And AI Alliance is all about those open source tooling that helps you move this, this industry forward. So, uh, Marta, I want to like, take us back in time 
1996, the US Telecoms Act. And I think it's often thought about it as a moment in which it was proactive regulation, but to Dante's point about an industrial uh, policy, it was deliberately designed to enable competition, to drive innovation, to set a bar that then the rest of the world literally had to follow. Um, I think I've heard a number of frustrated voices. The spirit of that idea has died, is what people say. Do you agree with that? I mean, and how do we, what, I mean, am I right in assuming that that was a, a, a model that maybe we could go back to? Um, what's the, what are the lessons learned from that? And you know, where are we with regards to? Yeah, I think process? fundamentally the question is, if we want innovation to thrive in any particular country, um, what is it that we need to do to, to enable it to thrive, right? And like I said, I think for the most part, the answer is actually not that much, but there are these really shining examples, for example, like, for example, Section 230, which actually enabled um, people on the uh, intermediaries on the internet to be able to have users that uh, put things onto their uh, platform without the platform itself being liable, which without that, the open internet would not have been able to thrive, right? Uh, net neutrality, another great example of where, okay, you can affirmatively do something, and that is going to have a huge impact to enable innovation to thrive. Um, and, you know, uh, stablecoin legislation is another example, and I think another example is uh, things like um, market structure legislation in the United States going through. So I think you actually don't have to do that much, but as regulators, as lawmakers, you can identify the thing that will enable the technology to thrive and make that happen and enable innovators to work in the country that you're in. Any of the spirit of that yes, existence it, in Europe? I was going to Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you know. Yeah, listen, I mean, uh, I had this uh, strange job of being uh, the ambassador to the tech industry and, and working out of Silicon Valley. And I, I can't remember a single European visitor, ministerial level, who didn't say, how can we replicate Silicon Valley in our home country? So I don't think there's much disagreement. And I, I'm pretty sure if you spoke to the 27 member states that have now put together the AI Act or the other pieces of regulation, all of them will say, well, this is fundamentally about driving innovation in Europe. We want to be a competitor at the global stage. The problem is that it's not necessarily working in practice. And this is, I think, the dilemma of, of regulation that, you know, in Europe, we're looking towards the US as the place for innovation. But, but, but at the same time, we're looking at a technology stack where we lost out on cloud computing. We don't have any hyperscalers. Productivity suites is not necessarily coming from Europe. And now you put AI uh, technology on top of it. That actually um, sort of creates a huge dependency on a few, as I said before, non-European uh, technology companies. So I think, you know, innovation, absolutely, let's find out how we do it. My guess would be most European decision makers believe they've done what they could in the best possible way to, to get it right. I'm just not sure we got it right because the tendency to over-regulate is out there also because of traditions around consumer protection, individual rights, et cetera. You are going to get the last word, I think. Oh, man. Unless you do this in 10 seconds. Positive uh, look, one. Minute and 10. I don't in know. the spirit of sharing, I'll give you some seconds. The, um, <laughs> <laughs> look, all I would say is for a global economy that throughout the COVID 19 pandemic was so entirely dependent on technology for any semblance of household, business, economic, and political continuity, technophobia from regulators is going to do none of us no good. And so I think we'd be well served to start shedding the fear and start injecting a dose of opportunity in the conversation. Christian, you've got 42 seconds. That was actually quite generous for Dante. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, I'll come back to what I started with. Innovation is absolutely necessary. Um, you know, right now we are working on quantum and there's gonna be next evolution. It means we have to change cryptography. There's gonna be evolution uh, from that perspective. But regulation shouldn't be something that should be feared about. It, you know, it's a responsibility of all the organizations and institutions to help make it right. It's education, it's enablement, it's engaging in the policy work early on and to be iterative in the form. So then um, adoption and compliance can make it easier for organizations. Well, yes, you came in under oh, time. Right? Yeah, okay, I want to first of all just thank <laughs> Filecoin for hosting this and for hosting me, for Catalyst and, and CNBC as well for that. And of course, a round of applause for this wonderful uh, panel. Marta Belcher, Dante Dispatrick, Dr. Kugay, and Salma Garajan.